And before we turn to that, would you like to see some footage from the archives? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so much of what's there, um, it is handwritten um, by by Doris and by all of you, you know, and other people who went to events, uh, signed guest books. So this is just an excerpt from a guest book where she says. You've had a great, someone says, you've had a great impact on so many of us. It's a great legacy. And when I saw that, I, it's, it's pretty incredible, the scanner that's available in the archive. You can blow things up. You can turn them around. You can modify. You can download. You can do so much. It's really terrific. And students know how to do these things, too. So it gets a lot of help. Um, but you know, it reminds me, I think of all the events that I go to and all the pamphlets and, and materials that are available. And you know, what is it that we as audience members leave when we come to an event? What do we leave behind? And sometimes we do sign a guest book or write a note of thanks afterwards or, or make a point of connection. And so now the archive has uh, quite a bit of evidence of the people who attended events all over the area and inside the state and out. So my way into an archive is to be visual. I'm, I, I uh, love looking at photographs, and the clock stops when I begin. You might be the same way. Uh, so I, I started there, and I looked at some of the, the older photographs, and I brought, I brought those tonight. So there's, uh, there's Doris as the proud teenager about to head down to Boston with her fur coat. <laughs> and this one is, is not, not great quality. This is actually Jim's um, Laconia High School graduating class. And you can see the size, and you can see it's, it's at the train station, I think. And of course, there's Laconia. I was looking for an early picture of Laconia. Um, I, don't ha I didn't see um, a lot. There's actually more photos of Jim than there are of, Do of Doris uh, during those years uh, uh, in the 20s. There's a few family photos, um, but it's the New Hampshire scene. And there's the guy that prevented Doris from graduating from college in a timely way, <laughs> although she did, of course, receive an honorary degree. Uh, and there they are together on the right. Don't you love those swim outfits? And there's Nantucket. One of the things that Doris said uh, about, about working um, working as a servant in a home, is that there were times where she really felt, um, you know, she really felt like she was lesser than the people she was working for. And of course, she was working with, as I mentioned, an African-American woman and her children. And when they went to the beach during the off time, there was a, there was a rope that cut the beach into two sides, and so she couldn't swim with her friend and, and son. And so they, they tried to transgress that a bit. And interestingly enough, it was Jim who had to go out and tell one of the young boys to cross over the line. So, 1928. Oh. 1934, maybe you can see. And so that's Doris with uh, Elizabeth and a doll <laughs> <laughs> on her mother-in-law's porch, I think. And there's Life Magazine. This is from 1965, so it was after um, after the, the journey that uh, the Haddocks made with their friends. And, uh, but she does have some materials that chronicle that trip and, of course, the unpub unpublished volume and some reflections that have been written and typed up. And the young uh, Foster who took notes, I think it was 1992, really, he went back and um, tried to retrace the steps and Doris typed up all of his notes. And so this is quite visible in the archive. It's over in the corner. Um, and it's the vest with the reflective, the reflective color and all the, all the various messages and places uh, that, sh that uh, Doris picked up along the way. She went through four pair of shoes, and I think she lamented sometimes that those were the questions people asked her, sort of, you know, questions mm -hmm. about, you know, material things rather than about the message and what she was trying to accomplish. Yeah. One of the one of my favorite pins, though, says, I love life. That's my favorite pin that she had. And here's another. This is from, uh, this is fairly recent. I think this was, this was from just a few years back um, after one of the events. And so if you wanted to use the car archives to reconnect with people who attended Doris's events over the years, you could you know, pretty easily 
as we find, Google is amazing. The quality of this is not terrific, um, but the log of the trek from January 1999 to end of February 2000, uh, it's over 500 pages of handwritten material. And pretty good handwriting <laughs> all the way along. Uh, and it was very methodical in, in the way um, it appears, in my view. So what I noticed, and I have not read all of the material, but what I noticed is um, what I have up here. It says, it's, so it's Tuesday, March 2nd, 99. We got started by 7 o'clock on our walk. What a difference it makes to get, in, to get an early start. We were through walking by 11.30. <laughs> you know, and I think she struggled with her growing entourage. People were not, were not able or as willing to get up early and, and start. But that was something that she took pleasure in. So she could do other things during the day because walking was not the only thing that, that was on her agenda through those times, as you know. Um, also, it would be really fascinating, I think, to look at the mother-son relationship. Um, it, you know, some of what's in her notes are attention to her feelings, you know, how she, wh whether she said the right thing or how she acted in a situation and noticing that she was tired and not as able to pay attention. So the kinds of things, if we all keep journals, that's what we write down, you know, and that's what gets left behind. So there's really a lot of emotion and it's from the, the um, Bullfrog films from her um, documentary. <laughs> oh, yeah. And this one, I, I just put this in here because I like it so much. She, um, Doris, I think, didn't, I, you can tell me, but um, I didn't think she thought she was very good with young children. She was really good with college students and really good with people once they had ideas, right? But I think with very young children, like when she was on Native American Reservation, there's a story she tells in one of her books about how she was kind of left with these young kids and not sure what to say, and so she told them to be good little boys and girls and obey their parents, and they're kind of just looking at her. <laughs> and, uh, and then finally a teacher came in, and so she was able to talk to the teacher and talk through the teacher to the children. And then she kept thinking about it and trying to work out a way to explain to kids what she was doing. And she explained it very simply in the end by saying that what she wanted to do was, was, was give them an example of of what can happen in a democracy and that it's make it really true that anybody can grow up to be president or at least to be a leader in um, a political leader unfettered by uh, money. She probably didn't use the word unfettered, but okay. But she says here, uh, this was shortly after that scene that I just described, and it's in parentheses. She says, I pause here to say I've worked out how to avoid getting a swelled head. I must separate <laughs> Granny D from Doris Haddock in my mind. I must stand back from from. I must stand back from this Granny D. Yeah, and so often people would run up to her, and and of course, um, you know, Jim and Dennis and, and all the people involved uh, were were very good about taking the van up ahead so that she, so that she, there would be some fanfare when she arrived at her final destination. And so, of course, right? Well, feels pretty good. But she, she thought about that, and she wondered, you know, why are all these kids around me, and what do they know? What, you know, what are they cheering for? And do they really think I'm a celebrity? Do they think I'm going to be on the cover of People? So. And I mentioned the book Americans Who Tell the Truth, and this is the dedication uh, for Granny D. Thank you for all that you have done to make America a more just and honest country. Your courage, wisdom, and articulate outrage have deeply inspired me. Forbes Federally. And this is from Franklin Pierce. We have some Franklin Pierce people here today. And this was a screening of the documentary. <laughs> and that's at Keene State. So those are just a few examples of, uh, of what's in the archive, but there's much, much more. So I hope, you, I hope that we do have uh, children in uh, thinking about it and using it. We won't tell them how she felt about them. <laughs> but I'm just joking, of course. But she, but I, I think there's real potential for um, you know for building local history and and uh, having college students and community pe community people in the archives as well. So, so thank you again. So any questions for Peggy? <laughs> I just have a question. I'm a doctoral student studying leadership at uh, Franklin Pierce, um, and my dissertation is specifically focusing on. All of that. Now, from your impressions of the archives, and, and 
I'm assuming, I think you mentioned that you had a brief conversation with Doris as well. Have you, what was her impression of leadership? I mean, did she feel that she was a leader? Um, and then kind of, you know, it's taken on that she's this, this woman of, of, of inspiration. I mean, would she, I mean, what, what is it, ultimately, what is her definition? Um, that's what I'm looking at right now. Yeah, well, just speaking on what she's left behind, I think you, I, what I would say is that you want to look at the difference between the folk hero and the person, mm. you know, and my point today is that it was the accumulation of all of those experiences, but particularly her early experiences, it seems to me, that created the person she was at 90. She spent a lot of time, both in the books that she published as well as in what she wrote down every day, reflecting on how those pieces connected. And she seemed very good. She wondered why people told her so much about themselves. You know, why did they pour their hearts out? Well, it's, maybe it's our culture. We all, we don't have privacy anymore, right? We all pour our hearts out to everybody who will listen, anybody, <laughs> perhaps. But maybe there was something about her. Um, Peggy, could you rephrase or restate what this question was because others couldn't hear it? Oh, I'm sorry. So I think what you're asking is what would her definition of leadership be? Yeah. So let me throw that out to to some others. Do any of you have something to say? Maybe Ruth or, or, or others? Did she see herself as a leader? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, I think that was part of her identity. Yeah. I think she felt the weight of that. The weight of what? The weight of being a leader. But I don't, I don't think she dwelled on it. I mean, I, I think that she had, if you look at how she spent her time, she reflected in her journal, in her writing. That was her time to process. Other than that, she was active. Right? She was really active. Her agenda was very active for so many years, right up to the end. And so I think making plans and setting an agenda and finding the people around her to help. I don't think she had the kind of charismatic leader notion for herself. Right. She had more of the, the let's, create a, a, let's create a responsive community. Let's create a group of people who share the same values and can and have different gifts and different skills and knowledge and can work together. And I kind sense. of felt maybe it was kind of thrown upon her, you know, the celebrity and you know, the folk hero, heroes things. She, I don't, I got the feeling that she went out because she felt very strongly about this and, mm -hmm. um, you know, wanted to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And then the rest was kind of piled on top of that. I'd like to invite some others to weigh in on this question. Oh, we knew her very well, and I would say she definitely would not have thought of herself as a leader. She didn't intend to be a leader. She was an activist. She had a cause, and the, she went after campaign finance reform. Those were her sacred words. Those were, that was her goal. Uh, and uh, all this hubbub that happened about Of course, she attracted attention. That was part of it. But not to become a leader, but, because, but to get success in the, her cause. I was struck that she rarely seemed to turn down an opportunity to get a larger audience. It appears from the documents that I've reviewed that she was very willing to do what it took. So yes, yes. the bigger the audience, the better. Yes, it was the message. To me, that's, le that's leadership. That's no, all. Okay, but, to me, that's <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's great, great point. I think that her interest in theater and the fact that she was a good actress um, plays into this in that I think she was always aware, and you, you had a wonderful example of that in the journal, uh, of the difference between herself as a person and the role she was playing. Mm -hmm. And it, it was one of the wonderful things about her was, to me, a lack of ego. Uh, an ability to see reality, see herself, uh, to be sort of step back and see herself, and always also a great sense of humor about it. So that she, you know, she really was fun to be with because she was very, very genuine. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I wonder sometimes about the mantle of Granny D versus Doris Haddock, right? And. So it appears that the reason she officially changed her name was because of the Senate run, that in order to get her name on the ballot in recognizable form, it had to say Granny D. 
So that was it, although she had been called that long before. But, you know, everything from the great hat to the, you know, the, the, the visual of Granny D, the theater of Granny D, was something that people responded to, as I said, without really knowing her, right? But once they did, and once they listened to her speech, it became a different scenario. She always did a lot of homework before she prepared her speeches. She was an excellent listener. We think of her as being an excellent speaker. But I think one reason people were drawn to her to share their intimate, personal concerns is they knew that she would listen without judging. <coughs> she would keep their privacy and their confidentiality. <coughs> she was real. Uh, she was committed, yes. And she knew how to separate Granny D as the character from Nana as the grandmother and the great-grandmother. And more than anything, she was a team player and encouraged others to become leaders in their own way. Yeah, I agree. I really had a sense that she was non-judgmental in the way that, that she interacted. Well, I spoke to her at her 100th birthday party, and uh, it, was, it was a public affair. And um, the <coughs> Supreme Court had just passed the legislation, had just ruled that any amount of money could be spent on campaigns and most of us were feeling a little discouraged about all that she had done and then this happened and she said to me and the people that were standing around at this one point, um, the community center had just been developed in Dublin, <coughs> right next door to the town hall basically, across the street. And she said, now we need to make a plan to everybody get together and figure out what we're going to do next. <laughs> and I thought, at her 100th birthday party, we'd be thinking, what are we going to do next? It was, it was priceless. Right. Yeah, and it, what I understand is that there, are, there was a speech or two that had been written and not delivered. Right. Yeah. She yeah, intended before she to give a speech <laughs> in Wisconsin in September of 2010. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that was the last undelivered one, mm -hmm. but that speech was read on her behalf. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> That's available on YouTube, inc incidentally. Yeah, uh -huh. you can see that, which is great. There's some great documentary footage on that's right on YouTube from and WMUR, all kinds of things. Not not only the documentary that many of you know. So. And I think you'd be interested to know that indeed she was thinking of others. She was an activist to the very end. The day that she had her final illness uh, and lost consciousness, I was privileged to be with her. And what was she planning in her last few conscious hours? How to, to uh, put her first book into a talking book for the blind, <coughs> and also wondering if somebody would help her go back on stage to do her one-act plays that she had done 60 years earlier in order to raise seed money for public funding in New Hampshire. Yeah. Oh so those were the last few conscious hours. Don't you love that? It's remarkable. Any other remembrances or stories? I could use a little help on this, but I think it must have been, was it her 100th birthday party in the executive council chamber at the state house? Mm -hmm. And, it was, and that was right after the Citizens United disaster. And, you know, anybody else might have been pretty depressed. But she told a story, and Ruth, you, you'll remember this, Ben, and jump in if I get it wrong. Uh, she had been at dinner one night many years before uh, with a couple who, uh, I think, I don't know if they lived in Dublin or where, but uh, they owned a summer cottage uh, not too far away. And it was just like a cabin or whatever, and they were renting it. And during this dinner party, the couple who were renting it came in to tell them, in great distress, that the cabin had burned down. And the host, I find this incredible, whatever, the host said, well, you know, don't, don't worry, it really wasn't a very good cabin anyhow. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and this would give us a chance to build a better one. And she turned that into a metaphor 
for what we had to do about this disastrous Citizens United thing. But the McCain-Feingold thing wasn't the best thing we could have had anyhow. So now we have to get something a lot better. Yeah, exactly. And that way she's like the, the authors of the book Grassroots, where they say, you know, there's a, there's a foundation, but start there. You know, use what existed before, but make it something completely new. Is that more or less right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's great. Right. So how should, how would Granny actually define community? I mean, her community. I mean, did, uh, she wa I mean, it was larger than what she thought of. I mean, in other words, yeah. Actually, how would she define her community? I mean, as, and being a leader. Well, when she finished her walk, she said she felt 20 years younger, and she said that she felt like she finally understood citizenship. You know, and I think that was because I think at the time she had not traveled. Uh, she, had, you know, she hadn't done extensive travel. I think she did do some traveling after that to Iceland, but but um, she hadn't been cross country by car or bus or train. <laughs> you know, she did it on foot. So. You know, I think her community, you know, my, the point I was trying to make with the concept of the public character is that, you know, her community wasn't, it was partly local because she, she was a grassroots person, that she, she believed her friend's work was as important as her work, yet she had no limit to the number of associates and friends that she would gather. And, you know, this was a time where... <clears throat> People were using email for sure, and there's plenty. There are many, many um, folders of email messages from strangers, relative strangers, who um, who she communicated back and forth with. I think she found community anywhere she went because she was so forward about her values that people would flock to her who shared those values. I would also add that when her films or doc the doc documentaries were uh, broadcast, they were also picked up internationally, and so that expanded her community to a global community in ways that hadn't before. Mm -hmm. And why were they picked up internationally? Do you think because of her age? No. Because of the unique way in which she chose to. Documentaries that were just shown and broadcast. Yeah, and I mean, her appeal is that what you're asking, really? Like, what was her appeal? And right, and she was on national. You know, she was on national programs. So, although they didn't ask her the questions necessarily she wanted to be asked, she was on the Today Show and she was on national programs. But she was on a lot of local programs, but all across the country. And what I know is that we read the local newspaper. You know, so so that that kind of information spread in a way that is much more ground up than. Um, you know, than maybe being on Oprah or, or, you know, for one time. It's because it was constant. And so that network built, you know, pretty quickly. So she met people who were in the United States visiting and, and were struck by what she was doing, and then it spread from there, the, the larger network. You never know who you're going to meet. <laughs>